New music means new project. This fall, the National Building Museum is bringing together leading black voices in design, art, and architecture for Intersections, a series of dynamic discussions about culture, equity, and representation through the lens of design. Launching September 16th and running through December 14th, Intersections engages nationally recognized black architects, designers, and artists in conversations focused on social justice in the built environment. Through interactive lectures and hands-on workshops, this series is designed to provoke new thinking, spark conversation, enlighten, and empower. In partnership with the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C., Architecture's Political Podcast will dive deeper into some of the topics as well as presenters stemming from this phenomenal series, Intersections. In case you're not from the area, let me tell you a little bit about the National Building Museum. Since it was created in 1980 through an act of Congress, the National Building Museum has transformed the public's understanding of the impact of architecture, engineering, landscape architecture, construction, planning, and design. Through exhibitions, educational programs, and special events, the National Building Museum welcomes visitors of all ages to experience stories about the built world and its power to shape lives, communities, and our future. Links to the Intersection series is in the show notes of each episode, which includes registration that's both in-person and virtual. So check it out. Here is a replay of Damar Matthews' interview from Off the Top Design. This is one of my favorite interviews to date. I think it's because I was most relaxed and most connected in what he was saying. I'm excited that you guys get to hear what he presented at the National Building Museum. This intro has been recorded prior to this session, so I have no idea what he's talking about, but I know it's going to be fire. Without further delay, here again is the replay of Damar Matthews from Off the Top. Here you go. Damar. Yeah. What's up? Nothing. Everything. Oh, yeah. I mean, a lot of nothing. What's up with you? Same. <laughs> Same difference. So, uh, have we met before? No, I mean, not in person or anything. Or not. I feel like maybe we spoke in passing at a thing, virtually, I'm sure. But no, nah, I don't know. I don't think so. Okay, I got to show you something. Oh. How we got connected. And I didn't even notice this until when I was doing research. I was like, that looks familiar. And then, oh. wait, oh, oh. Oh. And this is what I wrote. Yeah. Wait, what language is it? Dang. Yeah, that's. <laughs> okay, so for the audience, so I had wrote um, an article back in November in Domas Magazine, this international magazine. And the author, not author, I'm the author, the, the writer, I guess you translate this to, she was looking for some artwork and the original person she was going after didn't get back to her. And then she was like, well, do you know anybody? I was like, I don't know. I don't know anybody. And then she's like, okay, no, I found somebody. And I was like, okay, cool. So this came out and it ended up being your thesis, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is really weird. I don't know how I didn't even make that connection. Because that was off of, I want to say that was like, was that, that took you a while. I was tough on the communication for that, wasn't I? I'm bad on communication at times. I feel like I remember doing this specifically because I was like, dang, it's in what, what is Italy? But yeah, dang, no, I didn't know what back that for. But so we've been connected for a little minute. Yeah, we have that I didn't even know. Like, so... Who knows in the past what other connections that we 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 cross paths or something, but that, but yeah, but now I get to officially talk to you and yeah. get to know you a little bit better. I know I'm excited for this. I logged in. I'm wrong a week early. I was so excited. <laughs> I scare myself. You know, you ever wake up from naps and just think you're missing something? You yeah. Start panicking. That's one of those. All right. So tell me a little bit about yourself, sir. Sure. So my name is Damar Matthews. I'm from Moreno Valley, California. Life growing up. 
You know, I ain't never been asked that question before. It was it was cool, you know, I guess regular for what a lot of I mean, it was it was mostly good. Like, you know, I think regular kind of in relation to space and black architecture, looking back on your environment, how was it? There was not many spaces that I thought was like, I never even considered this thing, you know, that that there should be space that I am, like a safe space, you know, or like a, a space where I identify with the built environment. I definitely wouldn't say growing up there, even though, you know, most of my community was Black, my schools were Black and all that, I mean, you know, Black and um, Hispanic. No, nah, I was still definitely no. There was nothing in the built environment that makes you feel like your culture is is represented or anything in, in that sense. I think, you know, a lot of us know we in a Black neighborhood by, like, different signs get off the freeway or something and and you look around like that and that's really kind of how I started that thesis was what tells me that I'm in a black uh, a lot of times depending on where you at you know that can be the housing is going to look a little less than it will in most areas but yeah you have things like a lot of cops and a lot of like a decent amount of crime and a lot of I mean, I guess as far as space, just feeling comfortable in space or feeling represented in space, nah, that was not the place. But you knew yeah. something, did you know something was wrong? Not then, not then. I would say, you know, when I was real valley, like an hour outside of LA. So nah, I didn't notice anything was wrong, but I knew personally that there was like something with the scale that I didn't like, which of course I wouldn't even, under, I barely learned what scale was four years ago. But you no, know, I was always, I didn't like, understand this until later, but I was always driving to places with like tall buildings and I would just be riding, you know, and it wasn't even that I, that I identified with that. I just realized that it made me feel, it made me like feel better to be in that space, like where there's a lot going on, where buildings are taller than, like are, are very much taller than me. And I just liked that for some reason. So when I was able to start driving and things like that, and even to this day, that's kind of a thing like I'm attracted or I was attracted to. And I think that's like my first, I don't know, emotional connection with a built environment or with a, or like my first understanding of some, I don't know, some emotion connected to it, I guess. So was it the, so it was the height. It was like skyscrapers and it was, because it was different. Yeah. Was different. Yeah. That's what it was. You know, I stayed it's everything is two stories or one story, you know, over there, whether you in apartments or whatever, or house or whatever, it's all one, two story. And then even the mall, wherever you go in, pretty much, you know, and it's just warehouses. It's the home, it's the school, it's the warehouses. You know? But yeah, so I guess it was just to see buildings look different. Like in a lot of the homes there, Moreno Valley really only got like highly populated probably like 50 years ago, 60 years ago or something. Yeah, 50 years ago, maybe even 30 years ago. And so like an influx of black and brown people moved over there. So of course the built environment ain't going to be ready for you or ain't going to, you know, they're kind of just building regular straightforward housing and everybody going there. I think now you it just would seem so exciting to see lights on a building and to see it have like characteristics and to not just be this stucco rectangle. What got you into architecture? At what point that you wanted to study? Was it oh, undergrad or late past undergrad? I really didn't know about the profession or I didn't know of it as a profession until I was maybe man. <laughs> I mean, probably like 21, I was like, oh, that's a thing. But I didn't know, you know, I was already too far gone. I'm first generation college dude. I'm like, in my third year, found out that it's like a thing. But my major, when I was at Lincoln, I was just trying to figure out how to make money. So it was, I majored in bio and religion. And then once I graduated and was working in the field and hated my, then I was like, I got to figure something else out. And then I went and kind of, I was in the medical field for the most part and maybe like two, three years after undergrad, two years after undergrad, I just had to, yeah, I, I probably spent like six, six months to a year just researching something that I thought I'll be happy doing. 
and like buildings and design kind of kept staying for some reason in my head because I was in the art and different forms of you know, creativity, I guess. But I didn't know how, I didn't know anything that you could do to actually make money and and be happy, I guess, <laughs> you know? So yeah, I'm really only probably five years, six years in the architecture at the most. And I really just, I don't know how I discovered it. I'm more so, it's a heavy thing of meditating at a, you know, during that time when I was hating my job. And I found this TED talk and it was about this doctor who went to Africa and he was helping build a hospital in Africa. And he was showing how the things that he knew from America were helping impact all these design decisions that they were making um, at the hospital that he was building. And so then the dude like quits med or quits medicine and becomes an architect. I'm so inspired by just watching this 12 minute TED talk. And after that, I literally, I mean, a few years later, here I am. You realize that's all a lie. It was- yeah. I- that must be architecture Africa. in Africa. Yeah, like I said it with Africa. Oh. <laughs> so what made you come back to the West Coast? You were on the East Coast for a little bit and you were like, let me get the hell out of here. I miss my <laughs> beach and sun. And It was cold. It was cold. But I, I stayed there for, you know, I went. I only went to the East Coast to go to school at Lincoln University, at the first HBCU. I was just tired of the cold, really, and I wanted to be close to my family, my mom and my sister, my nieces all out here. And that's where I ended up going to Woodbury. I was working. So, yeah, that part of the story is less interesting. I was really just trying to get back closer to family. I ain't got no family out there, so I was just there alone most of the time. Okay, so you're back home. How was the architecture school there? At Woodbury? It was, it's a good school. I mean, it's a, they have like a very small what is it, student to faculty ratio, where you can have a studio and maybe there's between like 10 and 20 students in there. So it's nice, you know, you can have a 30 minute conversation one-on-one with the professor about an idea once you're able to formulate an idea. But yeah, I think that those things like that and, and most of the professors, it's pretty cool. I can't complain too much that I have like good and bad like every student but yeah I mean I was suggested or recommended to other students first there right yeah like it's weird diverse I know that they kind of say that they're like the most diverse architecture school or something but it's more so with I guess it's more than most of the other architecture schools but it's not like when I think diversity, I think I'm gonna see everybody at the table it ain't everybody at the table still you know it wasn't no other black grad students in my class or in my my three years of grad school probably like two or three between like two and seven undergrad black students so yeah it's like diverse for so if that makes sense so how did you connect with Janine and Janine is for everybody knows she's a community activist out of what so I connected with her really during my senior year as I was approaching my my thesis and it was pretty probably like the first day of the semester I already knew what I was interested in it had kind of been bubbling over the summer and I had a professor named Michael Pinto and I was just explaining to him you know I was kind of excited about the idea and so I'm really just looking for somebody to listen to me and so he uh, he was listening and he pointed me in her direction and gave me like a formal introduction and maybe like Two, three days later, we were on her site and watch next to the towers. And she's just like, you do your project here on the land. Uh, we take the land and blah, blah, blah. But so it was really just an organic kind of <laughs> meeting. And it was nice, you know. So and now we are partnered up on trying to develop that land with her down and watch and her property. And we're just doing like fundraising and frustrating thing of that but yeah that's how I meant this to me so the premise of black in architecture that came when did that come at, at what point you were, that that light bulb came on and was like wait something's wrong here I guess that aha I think that it was during the last summer of my like going into my thesis year that's when that's when I kind of started to put that together and it was more so it more so had to do with as I'm going into the thesis, they put this weight on 
on thesis and architecture. If you don't do the right thesis, or if you do the right thesis, you're going to, this can be the work you do your whole life. You know, and I was stressed out by that thought. And I'm like, man, I don't want to just choose. I'm watching my classmates like go through these thesis that just don't seem or feel important to me or feel like it it's something different or really interesting or be passionate about. I will watch people kind of hop through these thesis and I'm like, I know that I can't do that because coming in to grad or into architecture school, I was the worst student. Not because of like a bad work ethic, I just didn't know anything. My, my classroom was just, So I knew that I would have to kind of have something that I'm just going to stick on. And so as I go into that final year, I'm thinking of the Black aesthetics. I'm thinking of like, I guess I was just realizing, okay, if I go down this path, whatever I do, I guess I was afraid to work on something, to work on another thing all my life that I just wouldn't have real passion about. It. But the idea kind of formed around that thought where I was saying, okay, what, what projects have I done that I could see myself doing? You know, what, what type of work? And it was nothing, nothing that I had done, you know? And I'm like, why? And I realized like none of my projects were in black neighborhoods and, you know, none of my, none of my precedents that I was ever shown was in a black neighborhood or by a black architect. And I just felt like I was being trained to, to help other people's neighborhoods and to design for other people based off of their aesthetic. When my neighborhood don't got no aesthetic, that's like, you know, it, it don't, no identity yeah yeah like in the built environment yeah and that's that's what kind of like I guess sparked it that was that initial spark of an idea and then I just kind of started research I just went down a rabbit hole of like housing for black Americans ever since we arrived in America and then you start to kind of track okay initially you got slave houses these are hand-me-down houses coming from like where people used to keep their livestock and they just kind of, they didn't do no alterations. They, you know, and then you think of even now, all the way up to like, or you think of all the way up to like, say the 60s, 70s, where there's housing projects or even 30s, housing projects that are being built. Some that were initially being, in this area in LA, are being built for middle-class white people initially. And then they start to kind of get overcrowded and they're like, we don't have to let some Black people move in. Black people, we're going to move y'all out to these suburbs real quick. We'll give these to Blacks. You know, and it's just like, damn, we still get hand-me-down houses? Yeah, I mean, no, and it's, that's real. You know, that's real to not, to have your, not, your culture not thought of or considered when, when you place a big-ass thing in a neighborhood, you know? And so, yeah, that's, that's how it started, I guess. Yeah, that's the beginning, generally. So how did you find precedent? Did you find precedents? Oh, I'm going to be my own precedents. Like, how did that? No, nah, yeah, I did find precedent. Not of, like, exactly what I wanted to do. It was like, and that's how I think that I, that it naturally kind of evolved. The big, big precedent was with Jermaine Bourne, the work that he did in Opalaka. And that was kind of my first time ever seeing like a designing against displacement and trying to design with like I don't know local established aesthetic as it relates to black communities so in Opalaka they have a heavy Muslim community and to see like the aesthetics that they did to both in a garden and in like this I don't know in these different community kind of based spaces it just looked beautiful, you know, to, to see, because I had been seeing renders and seeing projects and seeing, you know, where where they have people living there and all this stuff. Like, oh, this is it after when the residents are living in there and you know what to expect. You go see one, one Black person in the renders, maybe. And when I see Jermaine's project, and it ain't no renders, you know, it's real Black people over there from Opalaka, like... I was just like excited, especially because Jermaine was a, is a younger dude. So, you know, we all are just looking for a path that we can see and follow for people. I'm looking at him like, okay, I can figure this thing out based off of his path. So that was kind of a, a, a big, that was a big precedent. I think every, that was probably the only, that and maybe Destination Crenshaw 
which started to kind of happen as I was going further in that year, which I found out about as I was going further in that in my thesis, were the two big precedents in architecture. Outside of that, my precedents were in art. And it can be any type. It could be music. It could be literature. It can be, you know, it can be, and a lot of it is in even conversation. I say art, but it's a lot of it's also in conversation where I can like have these small mental notes of things that I've listened to people say while I was there on the watch or something or wherever I am, or if I'm just listening to, to the documentary or something and there's just things that pop in my head from Black conversations, then that, those kind of were the precedent. Yeah. I would kind of have this taxonomy sheet of Black characteristics and then start to try and figure out how to represent a characteristic visually. Or on a building. Yeah, that's kind of how that part. Yeah, that's how that part kind of. Have you, you've always been into art, right? Like, so um, I feel like it's it's been like that that thing in the back that's just been following you ever, forever. Yeah, yeah, probably since like, I probably didn't start doing it actually till like 19. That's when I started. That's when I got like really, really exposed to it. I just never saw, I never saw art. You know, I mean, being that kid or something like that, where I'm like, oh, you know. So yeah, it it was. I was interested in it, and I didn't know. I just didn't know about that world until, and even really once I got into architecture, I was like, oh, oh, this is a like different means of like expressing creativity for sure. Yeah. So you wrote an article from Arcanet about your experience. How did that use this like? I'm going to write this down and I'm going to, did you pitch it? Did it come to you? Like what? Which one? The for like that uh, architecture education experience? Or, yeah, I was, I pitched it. I was mad. <laughs> I was mad that day. I, I was mad that week at a professor. I think rightfully so. Oh yeah. So, and the professor and I are cool, super cool, by the way, now. Uh, so I put that at the forefront. But, uh, but, but anyway, dude was, and I was in the class and then we only had like five or six people in the class and we had like all our art up or not art. We had all our, like these graphic visualizations. It was a visualization and he's going through all the classmates and I'm not sure why, but it's just like, you could be like, bah, or like, you know, you'd be like Peter Eisenman. You could be like Frank Gehry. And he gets to me and he's like, you can be like, I don't know, I don't know any black art, uh, like Obama, I don't know any black architects. And then, you know, I was just looking like, one, you know, I thought it was so weird, bro, so many levels, like, do is saying this in class. And at first, I'm thinking to like, respond how I'm going to respond outside of class, <laughs> you know? So, and I'm sitting there because I feel like tested. And so I'm trying to like, figure out how to handle this thing because I'm in public. But it's also like, you know. And you were the only yeah. one in class. The only black one yeah yeah and so like that i'm leaving the class right and i'm like yeah at first i'm like i'm not even kicked out of school because this shit is going you know and then uh, i'm just thinking like damn i can't be like a white architect not that i want to be a white architect because i'm black as hell but i can't you know like i'm not you could just put a white name right there like i can't be that you know and it kind of struck me that he didn't know a black architect like damn you know it's i don't know what year it was at that time but it was at least you know it was late two you could be like kevin that yeah. i work with yeah so i guess i so luckily we had gotten a assignment that same day that was like it was called intertextuality and so basically you take you go you grab other people's words that other people have written and you kind of are just stealing those words and placing them to express a feeling that you have or to like you know use other people's words to like and make it your own statement like other people's sentences so I went and I researched like all these black architects and their thoughts on working in like a predominantly white field white office academia etc and I just I, we only were supposed to submit like a paragraph. I submitted like a page and a half. And then at the end of it, I just stopped doing it. And I was just like speaking freely, like, oh, this is out of pocket. 
this is why, you know, and he's like, oh, I apologize. Like, I come meet me in person and, like, let's just talk about it. So I'm telling him, he's like, my bad, you know, and I was like, it's cool. <laughs> and he said, uh, you should write about it. Because the way that the email came across, you got some passion. Like, yeah. <laughs> so he progressed to write about it. And I'm, I was working with somebody who was an editor for Art Connect at the time. And I just pitched the idea to him and wrote it within like a month or something and got it. And then stuff got weird as soon as, as soon as that thing got published. It just got, I don't know. I mean, I had like the, like the Dean was hit me like, we need to talk, you know, like it was interesting in terms of like seeing the weight that that conversation or even that article kind of held in architecture at the time because I was having people from like New York and all this stuff when I'm in my class and Woodbury, not a good student technically, you know, like according to, so it was like, oh, okay, like, and I'm looking at it like, oh, my lane might even be there. I don't, I don't know. It was so much weight behind it that it just felt weird to even people saying, you know, literally the day after that thing came or the day it came out, like people from AIA and and Noma reaching out and you know it was just like it was just weird and new you know when I'm not don't nobody reach out to me <laughs> yeah it was a little different. All right, so you graduated your expensive paper that's hanging hopefully on the wall. I don't know. I ain't even put mine on the wall, but I'm about to What's up? buy some gold frames and lit some candles every night. Pull yeah. a statue there. Yes, but yes, I graduated, thank God, last year, right after COVID hit. And now I've just been full time in the architecture world with my own design studio off top, which I pretty much started as, as school was ending. And luckily, it's been like my full time thing ever since, but also been so, you know, there's been, of course, the, the work that has come along with that was kind of started in like residential with a lot of ADUs and now it's going up to offices and parks and community centers and large scale redevelopment quickly. The scale's changing very quickly. So, so let me let's go back a little bit. How'd you come with the, the name, the title? Oh yeah. Off top it, it's just off top means like for us, it means, I guess, like, kind of like intuitiveness. And I, this is a, such a horrible way of saying this, but like my cousin called me the other day and he was like, can I borrow $20? And my answer was off top. Like, yeah, you know, I, I don't got to think about it. Yeah. It's more of a slang term. A, okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and that's, like, yeah, of course. <laughs> as a child, I was on top of the table. Like, off, <laughs> off, You're like off the top. You know, I don't know. I just made that up. <laughs> no, everybody, yeah, I feel like everybody wants to be a lot deeper than weird. It ain't deep at all. It is really just what I really wanted was something that I don't know, you think of architecture school and it's random or something without without a real purpose. They just reject or it's architecture just rejects that. We don't intuitiveness. Show us where where you got that shape. Let me see it from your your early phase and let me see how it's changed to this. Mm -hmm. It's like, sometimes you can go and see something and it's, it's mental, you know, it's, I don't know, it's all here. And I just like that. That's how we sometimes, you know, people say like, oh, our first idea is probably not the, the best one. Sometimes it's the best one. Sometimes you it, know, it, you, just, you just did trash. Just yeah. wasted all that time. You could have yep. been developing the first thought and you wasted all your time doing that. But that's yeah. another good point, though, how in architecture, they want to see the thought process. Kind of like, I want to see you work out the math problem instead of just coming to the, the solution, you know? Yeah, yeah. They want you to show your work. Show yeah, but, and off top is just more of a, you know, sometimes, and it really does say a lot about like how I like designed to be solved in my office where I might hit something, right? I'm going to do a design for whatever. It can be a house, apartment, community center. And then we'll all have a talk about it. I'll do my, I'll send it over to say my intern and she does her thing and we talk about it. And then we shoot it over to if I have a consultant or if I have somebody who I'm just working at it with the guy, Robert from RLX, who I do a lot of work. 
take it, have it for a day, send it back. You know, don't think too much about this thing in that sense. Be free in how you express yourself and how you see and feel this because sometimes those things are hard to, I don't know, it's hard to show some of those things, especially with the idea. I don't know. Well, I think sometimes, I, you know, and I think it is, I think for an R and this, then this might go against my point, I guess, but I feel like it's more important to show it in this, like through this unearthing of Black aesthetic, this Black architecture. While we're trying to develop it, I think that for us to be able to show, and not like it needs to show in super crazy amount of diagrammatic detail, but show these Black influences that are, that are inspiring, whether it's like, I get inspired by, by like a dice game, you know, and I can see people shooting crap and understand that when I was in high school shooting crap and in my school, we are creating space. And it's like, damn, that's a whole different thought of how we use space or what we do with the, the built environment when it doesn't suit us or when we need to use it for something else. It's like open building in a sense, but... It's sustainable to have a girlfriend and she's always said the best sustainable building is a used one. I always keep that in my mind and the thought of sustainability the white way versus globally. Back in the day, you you have clotheslines to dry your clothes, but then some way, somehow it became like, ew, this is ugly. This is tacky. We're going to create all these like stupid little laws where you don't hang your clothes outside. You have yeah. to use this dryer that sets up energy, produces more heat versus just letting nature just dry your clothes. Yeah. In other countries, how they just use the resources that they have. Us, we use resources like during slave time, we ate pig intestines, you know, and then all of a sudden we have hot dogs. Like how, how did that happen? So, yeah, I mean. that's exactly it. That's exactly what I'm talking about, you know, and, and I don't know, I even think of like, say, are you familiar with like Crenshaw District Nothing. out here? Uh, okay. So Crenshaw District is in, in South Central. It's like the heart of South Central, so like one of there and Watts. But anyway, Crenshaw District would have like these, and there's a few out here. There's even another one in Com- Compton, like Sunday Car Club. But basically you'll go, and you can be down Crenshaw, it's, it's two, three hundred low riders, right? And all these Black people, just like what you were seeing, like Boys in the Hood or something before. Mm-hmm. But it's where now they are in cars outside and they made it like it's a living room. The car is treated as the house in this sense. And they, they went and shifted the whole space of a street. You know, Crenshaw, like one of the longest streets in LA. And they go and can take up three, four blocks because they're making like this active damn near block party or something you know it's it's you can go you are visiting people through their cars you're experiencing like you're being welcomed into somebody's world when you see and step into somebody's car and like I don't know you know and it's a subculture you know the low rider world is a subculture it's and it's just all these I don't know these thoughts around that like how do you this space for sure wasn't meant for you to just sit you know like they they ain't make that space for lowrider. Lowrider took the space. And it's like, I don't know, even that idea of like this gorilla shit where the cops end up, they want to come, they think that they can have a plan for how they're going to deal with it. It don't matter. Like they're going to be there every Sunday. Mm-hmm. You could try to chase them out, but you just ultimately are going to be dealing with this forever. And it's like the cops accept it to some sense. You know, like sometimes you get one who's going to like trip crazier than the next one. But I don't know, like these things, I feel like show so much power to be able to take space. That's like, that's what we're doing right now. We're fighting for space in the built environment. And, you know, and I think like these are sort of, those are the things that inspire me, like these sort of, of movements, you know, what, or even like, yeah. But, so I'm just super inspired by those, those ideas or style of ideas. Your business. How did you know what to do? <laughs> okay. So you like, I'm going to start LLC. I got a name. I got a client. How did you know? Because I've always been so intimidated about being an entrepreneur because there's taxes and 
getting paid and paying people and like so how'd you do it man it I still stress over that I like the biggest stress is like having an, just one employee is like changes your whole thing you know because you're like man I don't want to I think of an employee like I was the employee while I'm in school or anytime literally before I graduate where it's like I need that check at 1201. <laughs> Give me the check. <laughs> so now are you the person giving the check, but you also the person fighting in the back. It's it's scary sometimes. I'm not gonna lie. It's it's I just knew like, when I left grad school the first like I was I was applying for internships everywhere. I was never offered internships. You know, I through a few like interviews, but really probably like two. And one went really well, it went far, and I didn't get it, but whatever. So I come out of school, and I'm like, I don't know how many options I'm going to have. I also, like when I was like 20, 20, 21, or something like that, I caught a case, you know, when I was at Lincoln. So I'm like stressed, like, man, this is like a different, I don't know if they're going to like trip on me for like the case you know and I'm just like because it's a different it's a different it's this I completely understand like mm-hmm. I know DC I know where to go where to be how things work I lived in Boston for school and I'm like I don't know how this works <laughs> I need to know the rules <laughs> and regulations because I don't want to get caught up yeah so yeah. I, I I feel your fear yeah, so now, you know, I'm going into it. And I'm like, all right, man, I think, like, these people are going to look at me and they just, I don't feel like they was going to be able to, like, tell me my value. And I just, I always, like, I hated that idea. So anyway, I applied to, like, this firm once I graduated. And they were like, hey, we want to, you know, hire you or whatever. We, I, I read your work. I want to see if you need a job or something. I was like, all right, cool. You know, like, yeah, I'll try it. And so I went to have like the interview and stuff. They're like, look, we know you just graduated. I'm going to put you in as a designer, let you get real involved. You'll be doing everything. We're going to give you 18 an hour. I was like, what the f- 18? You know, I was making, I, I was making that. I was like, I just never, I was working as a server for undergrad. You know, I was making way more than 18 at Applebee's. You know, and I'm just like, man, this is, you know, and I'm just thinking, I just spent like a hundred something thousand on this degree. You gonna give me 18 coming out? You know, I'm just like, is this normal? First of all, is this normal or what? what? And uh, I still took it because I was afraid and I'm gonna just take it so I can like real firm experience. But I was running my own thing still at the same time. And already luckily I was running off up at the same time and I was beginning to take contracts and I was just learning from them as I was going, like how to handle situations and how to actually draw and they didn't teach you how to really draw in in school you know so I was trying to patch together different experiences to to be able to get my own shit through so yeah maybe within two weeks out of school I took a contract from the city to do vicinity map and screw myself up and I talk to people I I if people hit me up I'm gonna talk to you like I'm going to network with you. I'm bad at communication and to, like generally, but I can network. So anybody I could, you know, anybody in architecture or anybody, you know, I just started talking to people at the city and I would just take things that would help me. Like the A plus D museum while I was there, I used it. I, I tried to get indoors or I tried to meet people when I could. So that thing kind of came Oh, even from that article, the just the amount of networks from that article ended up helping me and still helped me today. So the the city was one of my first contracts, maybe my first contract. It was a horrible, I did a horrible, I did a good job, like the work, I did a good job on the work. I charged like 400, right? And I found oh, out, geez. oh my God. When, and then they replied to an email, I'm sorry, this is going to go off course, I'm just saying, no. they replied to a even though they like, I was like, okay, yeah, I'll charge this much. Because I didn't know what a vicinity map was. I had no clue. I'm just like, I'm going to take it. And because it was for Destination Crenshaw. So I'm like, yeah, like, I just want to say I'm involved. Like, send me something. And I look 
I go follow up the CC because somebody just replied all to me so I could see the chain. And they're like, this kid's going to do it for like four or 500. Other dude was going to do it for 7,000. I was like, oh my God. I, and that was when I completed it. It was already complete. And I'm looking like, yo, I could have just been. Uh. So after that, I've just been very careful about pay. But uh, as far as like getting jobs, it's, it is a network game. I'm in construction. I'm in project managing. I'm working with developers. It's all the projects come from really everywhere. They come from. It's all in your head. Like you all, all this juggling is in your head. Juggling for what? Specific? Oh my. Who's helping you? Who's helping you? Oh, no, nah, I got people helping me now. Okay. Before, yeah, it was just me. It now was just it's... you. Yeah, now I got a little squad rolling with me and helping me everything too. Strong ladies, thank God, man. So, uh, so was it, that a hard transition to do? That transition to owning or like into like the transition. The... Well, let's let's try that. The transition to I can trust other people with this information, or to trust other people with my business. It's hard, and I'm just like finally starting to let go on things because I was so overwhelmed and I'm still I get overwhelmed every other day at least but yeah now like where I understand that certain things with the black aesthetic in turn probably ain't gonna be able to do that for me because I'm crafting this thing but as far as the other work that I'm less interested in like design wise I I have to be able to trust them but that's also on me to be able to teach somebody well enough for them to understand and be able to take it and go forward but yeah it's definitely been a process i think is getting better now where i feel more comfortable i let people answer emails for me i let people run design meetings if i'm not in the room if i can't be there so yeah but it is other times where you see something or you see a you wanted something in the design or you wanted a specific verbiage in a letter to somebody and they are messed up in the head that whole day could be like you didn't do this right <laughs> like yeah you know <laughs> one of the people who work with me ariana we have a very specific way of how we write things because of how i want to be i guess portrayed in certain senses with whatever publication it is or i'm going over the thing and she says is that too vanilla you know if she writes it for me and I'm like, yeah, it's it's like you understand, you get this way of working this way. And so now it's, yeah, well, I think we're starting to hit our stride now, but nice it time. definitely, yeah, yeah. Nice you know, time. now I'll need one more person pretty much to add on pretty quickly. Do you have a projection like next two years, next five years, next, yeah. Oh my goodness, yeah, to the point where it's annoying. Yeah, for sure. Within the next Is five it, years. Or, or, or like, is it monetary? Is it projects? What is it? It's both. Because now I look at architecture, a business model is horrible. I need a different business model. So I don't want to go into it like that. My main is to, to be able to decide the type of projects that I take. This whole first year, I've been taking so many ADUs. You know what I'm like? It's good. So I can understand that scale and everything. And that's a good place to start with understanding permits and all that uh -huh. but now you don't get to design very much in ADUs I started to teach about ADUs so black people could understand how your house to build more wealth and equity how it's going over here that's not the ADUs that I'm building very often now they're becoming profitable to do those but I'm just not interested in that work as much anymore so now like it's it's about like the style or scale of work and it's also about yeah it's for sure still about money i got so much debt it don't make sense if i don't figure out how to make money off of this and right. it you also have to. don't make you have to. yeah yeah like... and ain't no way to especially when when i see some of these projects we just finished bidding for a like a project or something or yeah like a bureau of engineering so you look at these budgets you might have a 16 million dollar budget for a project and your architecture budget is $78,000. you are like, yo, this is, this is crazy, you know? Uh, so it's like, yeah, I'm going to get it somehow. And it had to be, you know, if I need to take, if I need to do art, I don't know, you know, but I want to make sure that I'm able to do Black architecture as, like, purely. I don't want to have to do those things. For, I don't want to do it 
for money if I don't, I don't know if I'm explaining that right. I want it to be passion. I don't want it to be. I think you don't want to worry it. about feeding your firm, right? Yeah. Like you don't want to, because that kind of just takes away from those things, you know? Yeah. And, and you want to, I think my big thing is that I don't want to be, I don't want to always be like, you know, architect is, it's like somebody needs to hire you for something. And I can't stand that thought. What we're doing in Watts and what we're doing a lot of our stuff right now is, is creating our own project. Sometimes we pulling up and doing guerrilla design at a park. Cool. You know, and that's going to just be out of pocket. And I'm okay with that when it's going in these black communities and these black, and these brown communities who need it and who need good design. But I want to be able to like feed those projects. So like right now, how the business is, is where we basically have Everybody who works can see every piece of money that's coming in and they know their percentage. Like I, everybody can see it. And they also see the percentage that's going back into off top and they know exactly what we're doing with off top money. The off top money is like we pay overhead and then we save for projects like this. So, and it's like, you can expect 25 to 30% of every dollar that's coming in is is going to funding the project that we choose. And hopefully now this is, I mean, it's shifting into development where we were, you know, where we're buying land at off top's name and, you know, we create projects in that sense to figure out how to make it profitable or else. And hopefully, or I said profitable or but profitable and figure ways to, you know, partner with the community on those, on those profits. So that's what, but to answer your ultimate, your five to your projection, our two or five year projection, I think within two years, actually, let me say five years. I just started teaching. I'll be starting in the fall down here in Long Beach. And I think in five years, I would like to be able to start the architecture program at Lincoln University, where I graduated from. We don't have an architecture program or construction or anything like that. And I think what I would really like from that is to be able to, to have this Black aesthetic be something that I'm teaching the kids at this HBCU where we can now go and build new buildings here in this aesthetic. Like the aesthetic really deserves to be cultivated at an HBCU or in multiple HBCUs. I've been able to see what they get taught at HBCUs in architecture schools or some. And it's like, I don't know, I think that it's so much more that we should be doing uh, for these Black architecture students. And that's what I see. So you're okay. saying, let me get this right. So you're saying that you want to start a school, a whole new brand new school, oh, yeah. a department, like you yeah. want to create your own department. Yeah, for sure. No, that's yeah. Right. That's been my goal since I was in school, though, <laughs> to think of like HBCU that is actually designed to, that's the most Black pride place you could be at an HBCU. There's so many people happy to be Black. And just, you know, I don't know, just the spirit and energy there. And and I just, I see that expressed in, in the architecture. And, like, I just see Lincoln with, like, these different buildings and beside, like, those red brick buildings that every, you know. But, yeah, that's that's my big goal, to be able to teach it there and, and have everything kind of come full circle. Wow. That's huge. I don't want to say it's, a, it's again, it's that fear. It's not a fear of failure because I failed a bunch of things. It's, it's, just, it's, I'm by myself. I can't pit fault on my principal. I can't, it's the company's fault. It's this fault. My fault. I don't think I yeah, can. Yeah, man, that, that stuff hurts. When you, yeah, I do agree that that stuff hurts. That is like a big, it's tough because I done made mistakes here where I'm like, when I see, black architects and having their own firm it's only one i hate that yeah and it's like you're just straight up you're just solo right and you're here trying to figure all this shit out or you get a partner like that in one case this is like there's actually two cases i know that it, that they were partnered okay. with but it was but they end up splitting i was really trying to like and i still always am trying to find people to like partner with and it's frustrating because I think the biggest thing, one, like I was looking for partnership because when I was trying to figure the idea out, it was so 
I, I just felt like, all right, I'm one black dude. I can't just make these declarations for black people in design, you know? And I wanted to be able to go over these things with people and everybody who I would try to like bring on and be like, yo, like we can run this 50-50. It's like, you gotta have somebody who's going to match your work ethic, who's going to be as responsible for everything as you are, who's going to care the same way you're going to care. That's and that's the, big that's the tough thing. Yeah. If you got a deadline and you're the only one who care about that deadline, it's tough, mm-hmm. you know? So, but I, I didn't, I named this off top because I didn't want my name on the studio. I didn't want people to think of it as just one person. And it's tough kind of like, I still wish that I could have a partner and I hope that the right one comes along or or that I can train up my intern well enough to become my life partner <laughs> because it's t- I would love that I would I would just you know and it, it makes you have to become more accountable for yourself and it's like you got to check yourself so often on so many things I hope somebody comes I hope I think if a if a woman hears this and wants to I guess it could be a man but I feel like right now it's it's me and two people who work with me are women and they're so much smarter than me. I just feel like I should continue that trend. If there's somebody who wants to partner and comes along, I'd be would it be for it. would it be another architect or would you pick someone that's like I've been looking for project managers, really. Somebody who can manage a project and also be able to design to like specification you know clearly be interested in like this black aesthetic otherwise if they weren't like architecture and specifically experienced in project management I would be open to like an artist coming on and we do it like that where you know I know I think then you can attack the aesthetic differently right now it's like me playing with or like playing with abstractions on certain things. And that's like the art component. And I guess when I am doing like a, my research is continuing through like graphic visualization, but I think it would be to have a conversation on somebody with how this should feel. Like that's the stuff that I look for is like feeling in a place or feeling in front of a place or, you know, just what does each different type of space make somebody feel. Yeah, I would love an artist. I would, I'd be interested in a psychologist. Oh, you know, it'd be, yeah, 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 let me get some, some, I don't know, so I don't know, I mean, I hope I get a real weird resume, but no, I am so open and so, would so much prefer a partnership. Yeah, me too, I I was looking for a co-host in the beginning, and they have families, and they have a life, and I was the one that was passionate about starting a podcast. And I was like, okay, here we go. And I do everything. I see by how you set everything up. You are organized by yourself. I'm trying to, yeah, I need things and lessons. I really want to, okay, so it's like, I'm looking at the time now. I want to respect your time. I'm right. good for another 15 at least. Yeah, whatever you need from me. I'm okay. Good. All right. Art and architecture. After that, then we'll wrap up. One of the things that I've been struggling with is finding my aesthetic in architecture school I've I can mimic anybody's style I think that in, in least I could say from my education is that I could piece together any of these old white dudes design principles or whatever and apply it to whatever building new or renovated interior exterior but to find my particular voice that has always been difficult for me and I felt like when I remember I was in school and I was just, I was just thrown upon, what is your design aesthetic? And I was mm-hmm. like, I don't know me. You, you taught me about European architecture and Egypt. In high school, there was this thing, you know, you heard of AXO program? Oh. Yeah. So it was this, this high school for the arts. One section was architecture. And I decided, you could build anything, you could do anything. And I did an apartment building. But my apartment building was a square with punch mm-hmm. windows. It was a walk-up brick and it, it had a pitch roof, no creativity. I literally took my environment and replicated it. In school, when I looked at these things, I was picking it apart, but I didn't connect to it. 
and going into what is black architecture and how we talked about earlier how it's like a hand-me-down what does that look like and then to look at what black art is the only art I know is through music how do you visualize music and then you have music videos and you have artists visualizing their own music what does this music mean to them but it's a constant of moving spaces is not it's not really a still like how a building is I mean you can make a building move I guess you yeah. walk around and stuff but how did you define your aesthetic what is your secret sauce so what is the because I don't want to mimic your stuff because it's area specific I feel like like I think yeah. that your stuff I can't put it in the middle of DC no nah, not this kind yeah I think you it's going yeah for sure and when I say like black aesthetic I don't think it's one like general black aesthetic I think right. yeah it's culture specific or you know area specific like you said I I think really a, it's kind of this where you know some of it is coming from I might take a, I don't know, I kind of pieced it all together very strangely. So I guess to start, I would go and just take sounds and sight, and I would just start to write simple observations. And I start to look at like small things, the, the signs that I was seeing in the neighborhood that are different. You know, I could go and see like a no cruising past this two times in two hours. You know, you're like, whoa, <laughs> you know, what kind of shit is that? Like, you can't get lost or you're going to get arrested <laughs> in a Black neighborhood. So I'm like, there's just like these certain things. You look at that and then you start to look at, like you, I guess the main thing was looking at signifiers. Like, like we were speaking about early, what's the sign you in a Black neighborhood? And I started to go and try and take those signs, right? The same way that I would take, like, initially I would take signs. Like, okay, what tells me I'm in Chinatown? What tells me I'm in like a uh, heavily populated Hispanic area? Like what are all these things in the built environment that are gonna tell me? And the ones that I was getting in black areas were so different. It wasn't the colors. It wasn't the texture of the roof. It wasn't like the, the you know, it was, it was, it started to be like these signs, like, all right, you got barbed wire in your backyard. You have, if your fin, if your, fr- your, your kid go and, and try to climb the fence, it's barbed wire back. And it's like, yo, what? you know, this man, it, it really is. And then you just start to like, of course, there's a heavier police presence, which adds to that. And then there's a heavy, like, uh, you even think of how housing projects look, how, you know, where there's cameras everywhere, there's, there's these big ass things on every, every wall of every building. I'm like, building 13. A unit, you know, like there's no, it's just a number yeah. and a system, you know. Yeah, it really. So, so they can be able to just identify you at like you are in a prison. You know, I just started to realize, like, damn, the black environment, a lot of these is really prison like. And I read this book by Rashad Shabazz, Do was saying how, and he was speaking about Chicago and the housing projects and, and black neighborhoods over there, and how a lot of these kids end up feeling like they're in a prison and how does it affect you socially, mentally, spiritually to grow up in that, you know? And so I started looking at it and I ended up looking at image in terms of a picture and image of perception. And that was really the big driver behind this thing. And this Black aesthetic is really that, where I want to see if you got barbed wire or old ass chain link fence and a like bad looking vacant building behind you so how somebody gonna feel when they come by and look at you you know and how somebody gonna feel if you in another area it's white picket fence a nice ass columns like your porch green grass and your streets are clean what's the perception then you know it's a difference in right. perception and, like, and i just felt like architecture was poorly representing black people or black neighborhoods and like I just tried to kind of figure out like, where Black people being properly perceived. And it's like, it's Black art. Whether that's going to be movies or poetry or TV, whatever that is, music or just like visual art. I was interested in all of them. Uh, and I just kind of started to marry things or let things have conversations. I even started to kind of go into the thoughts of like, 
like concept thoughts. Like if, if a liquor store and a black church could have a conversation architecturally, how's that look? Because you got a liquor store where people are super comfortable. You could walk in however you want and you feel like homey in a sense, you know, like grab this, grab this. I'm going to see people I know. If you know the dude in the back, you know, like it's compared to like church where you also feel home and familiar. Like there's usually cooking at the, at a black church. You'll go eat at the end of the thing. You sit in there for three hours. But they make you hug everybody. You just end up like it's, it's a familial thing. But you don't dress how you do for a right. liquor store. Right. You don't feel the same way that you do when you walk into a liquor store. You feel like holy. You feel, you know, like you shouldn't curse in here. Mm-hmm. You, and, you know, and you're like, oh, what? Yeah, you got two, two different things? spirits, right? You got two different spirits. Very much in, but, but very strong, probably not stronger anywhere in the world than in Black neighborhoods or mm-hmm. liquor stores or churches. Mm-hmm. You know, and you think of like, like when you look at the building, you might see it now, the one for Watts, like that conversation of liquor store and church. But that's what I'm interested in. Like, how do you, I don't know, I think it's, it's vibes and it's energy. And like now I'm having a little, I, that liquor store and church conversation will continue for like five years. So um, yeah. I got another one that was like low rider in the living room. Then you look at like the juxtaposition between these things. Do you think that you're perpetuating stereotypes? I take the positives out of these stereotypes. I don't really think that, you know, and it's like watermelon cutting tables, right? It's like watermelon is good as shit. You know what? Watermelon is good, you know, and it's like, dang, it's been, I remember I'm at a high school football thing. When you play football, you go down the line, everybody give you a little fruit cup, you get team meal and all this stuff. And I remember there was like oranges and watermelon. And I'm looking like, she's like, which one you want? I'm like, give me an orange. I want a watermelon, but in my head, I'm like, it's like, why do we care? Like, why, you know, it's like, you got a negative against eating a healthy fruit. And some of these things are like. It reminds me of that Dave Chappelle skit, and he was making fun of that Sunny D, and the guy opened up the, the refrigerator with Sunny D. He was like, do you want the purple stuff? And the black kid like. Yeah, <laughs> yes, you know. I think the, and actually, like, even that specific day to bell is something that I'm watching so heavy when I'm looking at, like, a new concept. And some of the, you know, I think that he's just way, he's so smart that it's like, you can play on this however, however he chooses to plan it, it's going to work. Yeah. Because, you know, and I hope that that goes like that. With the one. I don't know if I'm that smart, but I hope that, but no, I I'm definitely not afraid to like deal with like a stereotype, but I would never bastardize my culture. I don't want anybody to perceive it like that at all because that's not <laughs> that's not what it is. All right. So you you have some merch? Yeah, yeah, we have some merch that we're using to raise money for the build out and watch. So we have like t-shirts and sweaters, shorts all designed by me, backpacks a few little things yes this is just kind of a way to figure out you know we don't initially we were doing like just GoFundMe and just stay straightforward fundraising but it's trying to figure out how to how can we give something for fundraising so you at least have something in return but yeah so that we do have some merch um that's available on the website on offtopdesign.com definitely anybody who listens feel free to go check it out and buy something well, thank you so much, Damar. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It was a very nice conversation. It was funny. I laughed a little bit, too. <laughs> and you're doing well. Uh, with, without a partner, you're doing well. Your podcast doing good. Yeah. Not, you know, I got one question. What? Did, why did you want this podcast? You were saying how bad you wanted to start it. It was hard, even though you were looking for, like, a co-host. Why, why were you thinking to start a podcast why did it why was it so necessary for you? so Texas political started off with some co-workers because we always talk about politics and because we're so diverse I was like we should start a podcast so it was my idea and mm. they're like yeah Melissa sure I bought the domain name and everything bought the website and it just sat there and then people left everybody left mm. they you know went different jobs whatever and then it was time for me to renew and I was like, oh, shit, I spent all this, this, you know, it's not a lot of money, but, you know, you bought, you, you spent $10 on the domain name. So I was like, you know what? Let me do this. 
I've always wanted to investigate where I live, why that's our architecture and all that stuff. And so, you know what? I'm going to turn into a podcast and force myself to look into myself, how I grew up, the housing project I grew up in. At the same time, talk to Black and Brown people about architecture because there's no podcast out there that talks about Black and Brown people about architecture. So that's how I did it. And I went to podcast conferences and I read up on podcasts and I had my toe into that podcast community and ate the whole foot. It's the pinky toe. But yeah, so I've been doing this for over a year. I started January of last year. What do you think of your first year? I mean, now you in now you a year and a half in, but what do you know, think of right? it? Well, you, you always hustle the first year, right? So I did one every week. I had a podcast come out around every week. And Dang. yeah. And so I was like, I ain't doing that. Yeah. Yeah, that's tough. Um, so I have a, a lot backlog. of coordinating. I have I have a backlog actually that I need to get get out, spit out. Mm-hmm. But but yeah, I I've, I've enjoyed it. I get to talk to people like you. And it's been therapy. We got things in like like what it'd be at the tower it's not that like the towers were made by a i mean it's made by a, like an italian dude time rodea but mm-hmm. but the thought of like the sacred black space that you're in coming to what and to get to the center of what at the towers where like the teaching space around the towers is that is black you know and i'm thinking man i am see all these people come up when i'm working there or something and see these people who clearly ain't from the area ain't been here before they go pull up they look up from just this one side of the street if it's black people sitting on the other side like in the it's called a cultural crescent where there's like some seating and stuff but it's very like outdated you know it ain't like that well okay they don't even go to the other side of the street they get out the car look up from the street and they out five minutes they didn't came to watch they ain't spend no money in watch they didn't come to find out about this this historically black neighborhood who has been like through wild you know i don't know this is just a wild place you should really learn about it i'm just like damn people just come here and be like i'm gonna go see what i'm gonna see this, this italian dude did this piece over here it's frustrating uh-huh. to see like the black space be it's it's like look what they did over here it's like you know this place has potential you know and that's what uh and the potential is whatever they think in their mind, not what the people have done here or what they can do for the people here. But that's the only question I have for you. Thank you again for having me. So nice to talk to you. Oh, one last thing. How did you meet Kyra? I think after that article, um, that first one with Arconnect, mm-hmm. she had reached out to me on like LinkedIn or something like that. And then we just talk like every so often now. She's just a sweet person. See, she, I... <laughs> yeah, she is such a good person. Um, friendly, always trying to help. Mr. Matthews? Yeah, but I but get mad if I call her Miss. Yeah, I didn't like she old, but yeah, it, uh, she she is a great person. So I'm glad I can add you into her group now. Two great people. Yeah, thank you. Hey, listeners, I have an exciting announcement. I decided to launch a membership program for the show, where you have a chance to support me and the show directly. I love creating the show. And it means the world to me that you all tune in to keep hearing me week after week. But it takes an immense amount of time and energy to produce. I want to keep the show going and I want to invest in its growth. And I also want you to become a partner with me in this journey. That's why I'm excited to give you a chance to officially become a supporter of the show at glow.fm slash archispolly, A-R-C-H-I-S. P-O-L-L-Y, or by clicking the link in the show notes. It's quick and easy. It takes less than 30 seconds and just takes clicking a link in the show notes and using Apple or Google Pay. You don't have to create any new logins and you can contribute as much or as little as you like. If this show is part of your day or week and you like what I'm doing, then visit glow.fm slash archespolly, all one word, and support me and the show in any way you can today.